Learning economics is fun, but sometimes it can be hard to decide which fields of economics to explore. Maybe you're a student trying to decide which class to take, or maybe you're a lifelong learner trying to figure out how you can stay connected to economics. Well, today I'm going to convince you that economic history is the best field of economics. I'm going to explain how I came to fall in love with economic history and then how economic history has transformed the world. Then I'll end on how economic history has some of the most opportunity available to learners like yourself and make sure you stick around throughout the whole video because I'm going to be dropping book recommendations all throughout and I want to make sure that you hear about those. My name is Craig. Welcome to Market Power. Be sure to subscribe and let's go. You can only study overlapping generation models for so long before you start to question the decisions you've made in your life. It is the beginning of graduate school. I have started my career at Yale and I am learning economics. And every economics program, the first classes you're gonna take are microeconomics, macroeconomics, and econometrics. Or if you're cool and in with the lingo, micro, macro, and metrics the three M's. But don't let the names fool you. Even though they put economics in these names, none of them are actually about economics, at least not in the sense that you think about when you decide, hey, I want to go and get a PhD in economics. These are basically math classes in disguise. So while you decide to pursue a PhD because you just love the power of economics and markets to shape the world, you end up spending a whole year going into deep mathematical concepts that just really aren't that interesting. It didn't feel like economics was real anymore. I fell in love with economics because I could see the world and explain it. But in those classes, I couldn't see the world past my textbooks. But Yale also requires everyone to take an economic history class, and you often take it in your first year. So I, in my first semester, I'm taking economic history, which I have never studied before. I didn't have an economic history class even available at my undergraduate. It was a whole new experience for me. In this class, we're traipsing through history. We're learning about the Industrial Revolution. We're learning about international trade. And not just models, we are looking at what actually happened and how they compare to the models that we have. This was a whole new experience for me. We were talking about economics in the way that I wanted to learn economics. I wanted to understand not just the world around me today, I wanted to understand the past. And economic history told me that economics is not just something that we've made up since the late 1700s. The principles of economics have been governing our interactions throughout all of human history. Then I read a book in economic history that really helped me see what economists could do. Before I get to the book recommendation, let me give you some context. In economics research, there's a lot of value placed on how clever you can be. If you've read Freakonomics, you know what I'm talking about. It's fun, it's exhilarating, it's always a blast, but it also requires a lot of luck. Now that brings me to my book recommendation, Sharing the Prize by Gavin Wright. I've talked about this book before when I've talked about books that are good for learning economics. The reason why this one is so good is because of the simplicity that's in there. It's not about being clever and trying to show things that you wouldn't see. It's uncovering things that you should be able to see and showing very clear, obvious patterns about the economics of the civil rights movement. When I saw that, I saw a different way to do economics, just documenting basic facts about history and how incentives worked in the past. You can learn so much through that. You can understand what's going on in today's moments, given that you understand the past better. So I highly recommend Gavin Wright's Sharing the Prize. It's not the only book I'm recommending throughout this video, but this one it has a close place to my heart because it really changed the way that I saw economic history. Speaking of change, like that's how economic history changed me. I ended up going and studying economic history. My research today focuses on economic history, but how did economic history change the world? It's 2008 and the United States is on the brink of a financial collapse. You lived through this moment in history, but you might not understand what was going on in 2008. We had Bear Stearns on the brink of collapse, Lehman Brothers later on in that year. There are all these issues with financial institutions being brought to the brink and whether they were going to be saved or not. And at the helm of the ship, 
is Ben Bernanke, chairman of the Federal Reserve. In contrast to previous chairman of the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke has a different past. He is an academic, and it turns out Ben Bernanke's specialty, the one thing that he has been studying for decades, is the Great Depression. So he's thinking about what happened with the Great Depression, how there were bank failures, systematic failures, where one bank fails and it causes another one to fail. He's thinking about when those banks failed, how it disconnected people from their bankers, and then a lot of information and capital was lost just because we didn't know these personal connections anymore. He's thinking back to the panic of 1907 when somebody pulled a GameStop and tried to squeeze the short sellers by cornering the copper market and how that triggered a systemic panic. He knows that when financial institutions fall, it's not just that institution that fails, it is the system and it can spread like a contagion. His understanding of economic history was a guiding light in his policy response. It is what helped him prevent another Great Depression. If you want a really good account of how the Great Recession followed patterns of previous financial panics, you should check out In Fed We Trust. This one is great. It's really friendly to beginners. You don't have to be steeped in economics to understand what's going on. It is a solid understanding of history and how it has influenced the present. Understanding economic history literally changed our country. It has changed my life. Let's talk about the opportunity it has to change yours. I see two major opportunities in economic history if it piques your interest. One is pretty accessible, the other one, pretty ambitious. We'll save that one for a second. Let's start with the accessible one. Economic history is a great place for you to continue your connection to economics. It really gives you purpose as you're looking through history. I really enjoy when I'm reading history books looking for those economic details. I was recently reading a book on Hades history. Uh, it's called uh, Black Spartacus. The book itself is really interesting, but understanding the little economic details as they pop up has made it so much more enjoyable. And I think economic history provides a nice theme as you're going forward in history. There are plenty of people who enjoy history and then they get into the wars. And they're like, I'm just gonna really understand wars. Well, what if you got into history and you wanted to understand financial panics? Or you wanted to understand economic development? How did Haiti stay poor? Or how did Taiwan become rich? What is it that led to these countries to succeed? Those kind of questions can provide a really nice guide for you as you're exploring history. Two more recommendations on that part are right here. Oh my goodness, that is freaky. So one I am enjoying reading right now is VC in American History by Tom Nicholas. This is the history of venture capital. And I got it because I was really interested in the facts about Silicon Valley, trying to understand why Silicon Valley became such an entrepreneurial hotspot and why capital is there. I have really enjoyed that, but it's not just that part that's fun. It compares Silicon Valley to ancient whaling ventures when people would go out like Moby Dick and spear whales, how the model of financing those trips is very similar to what you see in the tech community today. One that I'll admit I haven't gotten to, it's sat on my shelf for a while, is Arts and Minds by Anton Howes. I've heard this is a fantastic book about the history of uh, science and how we came to understand science. I haven't gotten into it though, so I can't give a full recommendation of it, but I am interested in it. If you're interested in my review of this book or either of these books, just let me know in the comments below and I can talk about that in a future video. But economic history is a fantastic way to boost your consumption. It gives you really high marginal utility. That's the accessible opportunity. Let's talk about the ambitious opportunity. Economic history is still an area where there are a lot of big contributions just waiting to be made and discovered. I think economic history right now is in this place where if you want to be an amateur economist, you have so many resources that are just opening up to you. So many archives are putting their records online. They're digitizing them, making them available to just you and me. You have developing countries where no one has done anything in these countries. Now their records are being put online, you have an opportunity to look at archives that nobody has taken the time to explore. It's exciting, it's thrilling, 
People can make huge contributions just by going out there and doing a little bit of work that nobody else has done before. It's a great opportunity and there are plenty of examples of amateurs succeeding in this field. My favorite example is Rebecca Fried. Rebecca Fried was interested in understanding this past of Irish discrimination in America. And you might not know this, but historically, Americans didn't look at the Irish very fondly. And a common story passed on through the generations of Irish Americans was that you couldn't even apply for some jobs if you're Irish. They would just put a sign up that says, no Irish need apply. Now, a lot of historians had attacked this and debunked it saying, no, this didn't actually happen. This is just a folk tale passed on through the Irish Americans. Rebecca said, hey, I'll go check this out. And so she started going through newspaper archives, archives that had been posted online. Anybody was allowed to read them, but they were becoming searchable. You didn't have to go through and read necessarily every single single word, you could actually search these archives for keywords like Irish or apply. And she went through and pulled out dozens of examples of newspaper ads that listed help wanted, no Irish need apply. Tons of scholars had said that this didn't actually happen and this amateur comes in and disproves them. My favorite part of this story is that Rebecca was 14 when she made this discovery. A 14 year old went through and disproved professors, tenured professors with PhDs. She was able to use just a little bit of ambition and exploring these archives and she made an important contribution. We know more about the history of discrimination in America. This is so interesting to me. There are so many other examples of economists who aren't true economists. They're just people who like this and they start getting interested in history and they just put the pieces together and they make huge contributions. I love it. Maybe that's going to be you. If you're interested in learning more about economic history, go ahead and check out this video about the economic history of slavery. Also, this is a video in a series about the fields of economics. If you wanna learn more, go ahead and check out this playlist here.